But even as we reach for the heavens, our own world is steeped in poverty, ignorance, suffering, and war. The same technology we hope will someday take us to other worlds, even now threatens the existence of all life on this planet. Will mankind ever conquer the obstacles of space, time, and his own destructive nature? The Worldwide Church of God presents The World Tomorrow. The world today is a world of progress and poverty, triumph and tragedy, hope and frustration. Why? For more than half a century, this program has given a unique understanding of the meaning behind today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. This week on The World Tomorrow, David Albert. Greetings, friends. Last week on The World Tomorrow, we were discussing the topic, What is Man? And I was showing you at that time that man is not just another animal on this planet with no more future than a dog or a worm. I showed you from the Bible that mankind has a rendezvous with the universe. We saw that man was created to have dominion, rulership over this planet, and ultimately over what the scripture simply calls all things, meaning the entire universe. Today on The World Tomorrow, let's explore even more fully the destiny and true purpose of human existence, the answer to the question, why were you born? Human beings have always been intrigued by what we now call space or outer space, Men have for centuries peered in the heavens and wondered what all those brilliant, beautiful, and mysterious stars and planets meant. They sought to unlock the mysteries of the movement of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the wandering planets. They gave names to the unusual configurations of stars that came to be known as constellations, like the giant Orion marching through the winter sky or Pleiades, a tightly concentrated cluster of seven stars. They learn to navigate by constellations like the Big Dipper, which conveniently points the way to the North Star. What they couldn't know, of course, in those ancient times before the invention of the telescope, is that they weren't just seeing stars, but in many cases, whole galaxies that were so distant as to appear as a single pinprick of light galaxies as large and complex and breathtakingly beautiful as our own Milky Way galaxy. Galaxies of different shapes and sizes and colors, all scattered through the empty vastness of what we now call the universe. But what do they mean? And what do they mean to man? That's the question the really inquiring minds have asked since the dawn of time. Let's look again now at that eighth psalm where we read in verse 3 what David wrote. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, David said, he then asked in verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Yes, David asked here in Psalm 8, what is man in relationship to God and the starry universe? Well, let me tell you, he's something important in relationship to God and the universe. He has a role to play. He has a destiny to fulfill, but not in the way most imagine today. Man isn't ready for the universe yet, certainly not physically. He's too little now. His life is too short and too easily snuffed out. He may have the interest and the desire, but he's not really capable of the task of extending his dominion to the universe yet. We may dream of traveling to the stars, but let's be realistic. Certainly, we went to the moon and back in a few days, 
But that was only a tiny journey by the standards of real space travel. Remember the little space probes like the one that just sent back those remarkable pictures from the planet Uranus. It took over nine years traveling at thousands of miles an hour to get there. It takes those space probes many years before they even leave the solar system and soar off into deep space. And as much as 40,000 years before they reach the vicinity of other stars. If we could travel at the speed of light, we would need two million years to travel to the nearest galaxy. Obviously, this vast universe with its billions of stars is beyond the reach of physical mortal man. More importantly, man's not ready for it spiritually. He hasn't demonstrated that he can even handle what he's been given here on this planet. His body isn't good enough, but neither is his mind, his nature, or his character. Man is not qualified, morally or spiritually, to rule either the Earth or outer space at this time. But can that change? Can mankind ever rise above its present status of hatred and violence, of killing and warfare, and the threat of total destruction? What kind of beings are we, anyway, who reach for the stars while standing on a planet soaked with our own blood? It's ironic, isn't it? that we as human beings have such high and lofty aspirations and at the same time such painfully obvious limitations and weaknesses. Is there a solution? Can man's predicament be solved? Yes, it can. Most people don't know how, but many people today are beginning to see the seriousness of the problem and that far from extending his domain into outer space, man may first blow himself right off this planet. There is the real possibility that man may put an end to man. But that isn't man's destiny, and that's not how it will come out. Mankind may not realize it yet, but God is going to intervene in world affairs, and God is going to solve man's problems for him. God is going to deal with man's weaknesses. God is going to solve the dilemma. But before I show you what God reveals is the answer to man's problem, let me first acquaint you with what man knows now about who he is and why he is. Perhaps I should explain that in addition to being a graduate of Ambassador College, I also have a couple of graduate degrees in psychology. So I have a pretty good level of awareness of how the philosophers and psychologists of our day assess this issue of what is man and why is man. Many authors grapple with these big questions, the question of what is man comes up time and again in the various disciplines. But what kind of answers do these thinkers and writers give? No one I've ever read sums it up as clearly and eloquently as Ernest Becker in his Pulitzer Prize-winning book entitled The Denial of Death. You see, Becker, who was a brilliant author and teacher and lecturer in the United States and Canada, was himself dying of cancer when he wrote this moving volume. He stood on top of the disciplines of psychology, psychiatry, and cultural anthropology. He knew very well what they had to say and made regular contributions of his own that were well received. So he knew what was out there in terms of answers. He was well informed about what man had to say about man. And what did he conclude in his search for answers? Let me give you just two brief quotations that answer that question. First, on page 193 of this book, about psychology and psychoanalysis, Becker wrote, psychology narrows the cause for personal unhappiness down to the person himself, and then he is stuck with himself. All the analysis in the world doesn't allow the person to find out who he is and why he is here on earth, why he has to die, and how he can make his life a triumph. Isn't that a startling admission? And you know, he's absolutely right. Modern psychology doesn't answer those questions. In many cases, it doesn't even address those questions. Does that come as a surprise to you? It doesn't if you know what it has to say. 
Now notice what Becker says happens when psychology pretends to speak to these issues. It is when psychology pretends to do this, when it offers itself as a full explanation of human unhappiness, that it becomes a fraud that makes the situation of modern man an impasse from which he cannot escape. Those are strong words. They're not my words. They're the words of a Pulitzer Prize winning author and I can only emphatically agree. The man's right. Notice that he said that modern man doesn't know how to make his life a triumph. In other words, successful, fulfilling, and satisfying. And he's right on that count, too. We're not showing many signs of triumphantly successful lives on this planet, are we? But now let's go to the second quote I mentioned. It's even more stunning in many respects. I want you to hear what this clear thinker had to say before his untimely death in 1974 at only 50 years of age. On page 156, he wrote these powerful words. Listen to them. Here is the most precise statement of what man knows about himself and his purpose that you will ever hear or read. I quote, We don't know on this planet what the universe wants from us, or is prepared to give us. We don't have an answer to the question of what our duty is, what we should be doing on this earth. We live in utter darkness about who we are and why we are here, yet we know it must have some meaning. There you have it. What man knows about himself and his purpose can be summed up in just three little words. We don't no. To me, these frank, open, honest admissions are a startling fulfillment of Isaiah 59, verses 8 to 11. Notice it here. Isaiah 59 and verse 8. God says, The way of peace they know not. I don't think any of us looking at the world situation today would have any argument with that statement. Verse 9 continues. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold, obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. Once again, how did Ernest Becker put it? He said, we live in utter darkness about who we are and why we are here. What a remarkable confirmation of this Bible prophecy in Isaiah. It continues in verse 10. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. What a tragedy! But that's exactly where modern man is today. And some people, such as Ernest Becker, have the honesty and courage to admit it. Mankind has been able to powerfully develop his knowledge about the physical world around him but he still stands in total ignorance about spiritual matters, including, as Becker put it, who he is and why he is and what he should be doing on this earth. Well, Ernest Becker has been dead for over 10 years now, and as anyone from the scientific community, from psychology or psychiatry or the other disciplines come up with a rebuttal, has anyone claimed to really know the answers to these basic questions? No. I've never heard of it, and I'm sure you haven't either. There simply hasn't been one. The sciences and disciplines Becker represented have simply made no reply because they have nothing to say on these great issues. They continue to busy themselves with other matters, lesser matters, while the big questions go unanswered. So clearly, if there are answers, and if we're going to get any answers to these questions, we're going to have to look somewhere else. And thankfully, there are answers, truthful and satisfying answers to these questions. We don't have to grope like the blind in the dark. The answers to these questions are revealed in God's Word. And now that I've shown you where the answers aren't to be found, let's get back to where they can be found in God's Word, the Bible. We were reading last time in Hebrews 2. Let's go back there again now and continue from where we left off. 
we'd read up through verse 8, where Paul comments on Psalm 8 by saying, quote, We see not yet all things put under him, that is, man. And I mentioned last time that there are many things that aren't yet under man's dominion, even though all things will be in time. And that means exactly what it says. All things, including the stars and planets and distant galaxies of the universe. But now let's read on. Notice verse 9. But we see Jesus. What does that mean? Paul is here saying that we don't see mankind as a whole yet fulfilling its destiny, but we do see Jesus, who did as a prototype of what's possible for all humanity. Notice the rest. Who was made a little lower than the angels. Like every other man, in other words. He was a mortal human when he was here on this earth. And now back to verse 9. For the suffering of death. Yes, it's appointed unto all men once to die, as it says in Hebrews 9 and verse 27. So Jesus Christ himself died as a man. But now notice he has been crowned with glory and honor. Remember, that's what David said in Psalm 8 was man's destiny, to be crowned with glory and honor. But of all human beings, only Christ has experienced that so far. You and I haven't been crowned with glory and honor yet, have we? Of course not. Neither has anyone else. That is to occur in the resurrection from the dead at Christ's second coming. But Jesus Christ has undergone a resurrection, and he has received power and glory and honor from his heavenly Father. Now let's continue in verse 10. This is a critically important verse, and I want you to understand it. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. Jesus Christ isn't the only son of God. God is going to bring many sons of God to glory. I wonder if your mind fully grasps what God means here by glory. Can you imagine yourself with a glorified spirit body? Let's tie in at this point a related scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 41. The same author, the Apostle Paul, writes here, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. You see, we're going to differ in glory according to our reward in God's kingdom. Let's continue in verse 42. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. By raised here, Paul means raised up in the resurrection from the dead. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about. Let's continue. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Paul adds, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Spiritual bodies would be up to the demands of space. They would be beyond the physical limitations of matter, space, and time. Do we begin to see from these scriptures where God is taking us? Let's notice now verse 49 as well. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. In form and substance, we're going to be like God someday, according to these verses. And continuing further, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Yes, we are destined to be changed from flesh to spirit, to bear, as Paul says, the image of the heavenly. In other words, to be like God, to be the sons of God in his very family. Now let's notice one other supporting scripture in this regard that's equally clear and to the point, because I really want you to understand this. Notice now 1 John 3 and verse 2 where this other New Testament apostle, the apostle John, writes, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, 
That is, as Christians, that's what we are at this time if we've received God's Spirit. And John writes, And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Here's another verse in our Bibles that tells us that we will be like him, that is, glorified, powerful, spirit-composed sons of God. Think of it. That is man's destiny. That is man's future and his potential. That's why people are born. That's why you were born. There's no need to live in utter darkness about who we are and why we are when it's all revealed right here in God's Word. But now let's go back to Hebrews 2 and finish verse 10 because there's more there that we didn't read yet and it's vitally important. After it says that God is bringing many sons unto glory, as we read a moment ago, it says that it became him to make the captain of their salvation, that is, the front runner, the pioneer, or the leader of our salvation, notice it now, perfect through sufferings. And with that word, we move from the what we are to become to the how. It takes character to attain God's kingdom, and that character is often gained through suffering. The Bible has a lot to say about character and character development, as I'll show you now from a booklet which I will be offering you at the end of this program. Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong knew what character was and how it was developed and why it was essential to God's purpose. Let me read you this definition of character as found in his booklet, Why Were You Born? He asks on page 23, do you see what God is creating in you and me? He is creating something higher than angels or archangels. He is creating the supreme masterpiece of all God's creation, holy, perfect spiritual characters. And what is character, Mr. Armstrong asks? Perfect character, such as God is creating in us, is a person who is a separate entity from God who, through independent free choice, has come to know and to choose and to do what is right. Can you see why we must attain this kind of character before we are truly fit for eternity and the universe? There's simply no other way we can fulfill our destiny. There is no other way it would work. The character development must come first. Let's continue later down the page in this eye-opening booklet. Mr. Armstrong writes, Character is the possession and practice of love, patience, mercy, faith, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, self-restraint, and right self-direction. Character involves knowledge, wisdom, purpose, ability, all properly controlled and developed through independent choice. What Mr. Armstrong is describing is the very nature of God. God already has this kind of character, and he has a plan by which it can also be developed in us. Now, a world filled with people or beings such as these with this kind of character would be a beautiful world. It would be a safe world, a happy world, a world and a universe at peace. All of this is made very plain in this amazing eye-opening booklet, Why Were You Born? You need this booklet, and we'll send it to you absolutely free of charge. You owe it to yourself to request this booklet, to read it, to examine it, to think about it, and then to decide for yourself whether or not this man knew what he was talking about. This booklet has been a turning point in the lives of thousands of our listeners over the years. Let me tell you that a life with meaning, true meaning, is a very different kind of life than life without meaning or purpose. I hope you're ready to examine the issue of the purpose of human existence and to find out the answer to the question, why were you born? And at the same time, request your awesome future 
a booklet that explains our incredible human potential and why you probably never understood it before. Sadly, even many professing Christians don't understand the full meaning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This booklet explains the difference between the true gospel and the counterfeit gospel that began circulating as early as the first century A.D. These two booklets, Why Were You Born? and Your Awesome Future, are absolutely free, and you can have them by simply calling our toll-free number 1-800-423-4444. That's 1-800-423-4444. It's a free call, and we have hundreds of operators waiting. But if you don't get through right away, call us again in 10 or 15 minutes. That's 1-800-423-4444. And while you're at it, why not request your free subscription to the Plain Truth magazine, a mass circulation magazine printed in seven languages and read by millions worldwide. It was founded by Herbert W. Armstrong over 50 years ago. There are articles showing the events and trends of world affairs and how they relate to the prophecies of the Bible. It's also a human interest magazine giving solutions to the problems facing families in today's complex world. So for a free subscription to The Plain Truth and these free booklets, Why Were You Born and Your Awesome Future, call 1-800-423-4444. That's 1-800-423-4444. Or, if you prefer, you can write the world tomorrow. Pasadena, California, 91123. That's the world tomorrow. Pasadena, California, 91123. Next week, you'll be hearing again from David Hume, who will be talking about an interesting and important subject is there a devil? Is he real or only a figment in the imaginations of superstitious people? You need to know. So until next time, this is David Albert for The World Tomorrow saying goodbye, friends. For the free literature offered on this program, write The World Tomorrow, Pasadena, California, 91123.